Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, we will get started in about one minute. Um, we will start about at 2.01. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, Making a Difference in Adult and Family Literacy. My name is Nicole. I am the Education and Training Coordinator with Florida Literacy Coalition. Uh, this uh, webinar is hosted by the Florida Literacy Coalition, which is uh, Florida's Adult and Family Literacy Resource Center. Before we begin, I would like to show you the control panel uh, and give you a walkthrough of some of the functions you have available. Um, on your control panel, you'll see a red arrow. Your control panel will actually uh, minimize itself if you're not active in it for a while. So if you want to bring it back out, you just press that red button and it'll uh, bring your control panel back out. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll also see a hand icon. That's your hand raise icon. So throughout the webinar, um, one of the presenters may uh, ask an informal poll uh, to see a show of hands. If they do ask that, you go ahead and press that hand icon there. All right. Um, also, there is a questions box on your control panel, on the main portion of your control panel. That is where you can enter all of your questions for the presenters. Um, if you have any technical questions, you can go ahead and enter those in the questions box as well, and I'll answer that privately to you. Um, Please uh, go ahead and ask all your questions throughout the webinar. We will stop at a couple of places to read those questions out loud. Uh, so your questions will be read out loud um, so the presenter can answer them uh, for the rest of the group. Uh, at the end, we will do a Q&A session where we can unmute everyone. So towards the end, uh, I will give everyone the ability to unmute your own uh, microphone. So there should be a, either a microphone or a phone icon on your uh, main screen. Once we give you the ability to unmute yourself, just click that and you should be able to talk to the rest of the group. Uh, on your control panel towards the bottom, you'll see some handouts. Uh, we have two handouts. If you click those, you can download them to follow along right now. Um, I do want to mention a few things. Uh, an email went out with the wrong time. Uh, this webinar actually ends at 3.15, not um, And we also will be recording this webinar. So I'm going to give you a heads up for those of you who are interested in maybe do, uh, talking during the Q&A session. Okay, so I believe that's it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Greg Smith. Okay, well, thank you, Nicole, and welcome everybody this afternoon. Appreciate your willingness to join us to have this discussion about libraries and literacy. Uh, as many of you know, there are libraries and library systems throughout Florida and throughout the country that have had a long and, and rich history offering literacy programming. Uh, these libraries often have had a significant impact on their communities by providing volunteer based adult literacy, family literacy, and English language instructional services. Uh, they often serve as an important, to serve a, an important niche not met by other programs. And this is particularly true in rural areas with limited educational opportunities. So we're going to discuss today how libraries can be engaged in supporting adult and family literacy, why it's important, what it looks like, how it may be funded and available resources 
and support services um, uh, to support this work. So um, with that, um, if you can go to the next slide, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, and we, the sort of the photos correspond with the, the listing underneath. Um, I'm Greg Smith, Executive Director of the Florida Literacy Coalition. Uh, we're joined by Sandy Newell uh, with the Florida Division of Library and Information Services in Tallahassee. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Sandy, who's done a lot of great work at the State Library and in other capacities for years, uh, focused on literacy and, and supporting uh, public library administration. Also joined by Katrina Evans, the library director at the Columbia County Public Library, which has had a successful adult literacy program for several decades now. And Susan Mutchler, library manager for Citrus County. Uh, Susan has a full plate managing several branches in Citrus County, as well as their adult literacy and early literacy programs. So we're gonna start by um, uh, doing a quick poll here we can. So we just wanted to get and get a sense of why you're here. What's your uh, number one reason uh, for attending the webinar today to uh, look at potentially starting a new program, uh, improving an existing program, or you're just sort of just curious about the whole thing. So if you can go ahead and um, complete that poll, we'll give you 20 seconds or so to do that. Okay, looks like most of the folks have completed it. So can we go ahead and close that poll out, Nicole? Yep, I'll share okay. the results with everyone. Very good. Okay, so 8% of you indicated that you're interested in potentially starting a new program, 33% improving an existing program, and uh, the majority are uh, just curious about the whole thing. So uh, hopefully we can uh, we can fulfill your curiosity and answer some questions and. Um, to share with you uh, some information that might be useful in your local efforts. So um, with that, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit about um, sort of the issue in general, adult literacy in the United States, the problem, and it is an issue uh, of greater scope and impact than many people realize. Um, and, and I like this, uh, this chart here because it provides some point of reference in terms of uh, ability levels at, at each uh, literacy skill level. So 14% of the American population approximately uh, are at a below basic literacy level uh, and 29% are at a basic level. So those are the two sort of levels that literacy programs traditionally uh, focus on uh, and these examples uh, from the, the research that shows uh, sort of what their ability level is. These are all these are related to sort of uh, medical applications and so forth. So at a below basic level, uh, circle, circling the date on a medical appointment uh, for a hospital appointment slip. So that's sort of where what that level is that people may have minimal skills where they're not able to to function at that level at the 29%, excuse me, at the basic level at 29%, uh, giving two reasons a person should be uh, be tested for a specific disease based on information that they, they find in a clearly written pamphlet. Um, so the average score is sort of right in between there. That's a national average. The 44% are at an intermediate level, determining what time a person can take a prescription uh, medication based on information on the drug label. That's related to time uh, and um, the medication, uh, timing of the medication to eating. So that's something that's a real sort of practical thing that many people have to deal with and a good percentage of the population, you know, would struggle with that. Um, so this kind of illustrates, you know, where we are as a nation, uh, not in a real good place when it comes to, to literacy skills. Um, if we, uh, one, one thing I did want to mention is that um, we, uh, as compared to other countries, there was a, a, 
a research study done called PIAC, the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies in 2012 that showed that the U.S. is below average um, on both literacy and math skills as compared to 22 other industrialized countries. Um, and one thing that's certainly worth noting is that uh, there's going to be some data that's going to be released. It's projected to be released next month in March uh, that provides local um, area estimates based on the PIAC research. Uh, and this is the first time county level data will be look out for that. Uh, collectively, programs in the United States serve only about 10% of the population. In Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about the impact. What is the impact? Well, it's, it's pretty significant. Unfortunately, there, uh, there's an intergenerational cycle that often exists. You know, children of parents uh, with low literacy skills are much more likely to experience the same themselves. Uh, about 72% more likely according to research. And so working with parents can have a truly profound uh, impact for generations to come. And Barbara Bush used to talk a lot about that and, and it is true, uh, sort of stopping that cycle. Adults with low literacy skills are also more likely to live in poverty, uh, be unemployed and receive, and receive public assistance. <clears throat> and see their, their earning power is much less than those with an education, including those with a high school diploma or GED. I've just shared a few statistics here, uh, but when you delve into this, you'll find that literacy is, uh, is a thread that runs through lots of issues in our society. In Florida, we're also a very diverse state. Um, one in five Floridians are um, first-generation immigrants. Um, we're in the top three states, along with California and Texas. California, we're, we're the third after California and Texas, and the overall number of um, immigrants in our state. Um, this population, as you may be aware, varies widely in terms of their education and background. Uh, some have advanced degrees and have worked in their home countries and professions, such as engineers and nurses and doctors, attorneys, and so forth. Um, and it's not uncommon for these folks when they come here to be working in low skilled professions um, in large part because uh, they lack English skills. So it's a, a true waste of talent um, and a lot of people sort of working well below their potential. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, about 50% of immigrants who come to the United States lack a high school diploma, uh, many of whom may not be literate in their native language. Next slide. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Sandy to talk a little bit about history of Hello. literacy libraries. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session, and thanks to the uh, Florida Literacy Coalition for putting it on. Um, I'm covering here just a little bit of what's happened over the years and the growth of, of libraries and education, and tying in back to what Greg was just talking about, the um, early on, the immigrants coming over from other countries have actually flocked to our free public libraries. Now, these have usually been in urban areas like Baltimore, New York City, where they actually had free urban libraries. Here in Florida, you know, some of our larger uh, towns would have the free uh, public libraries, but Florida at this time was pretty much a Wild West state since we didn't have air conditioning. So the real trigger on getting literacy programs across the country was the uh, Library Services and Construction Act, or FCA, because actually in that particular law and the federal funding uh, was a, um, a category for adult literacy was in there. And in fact, that's where I worked in Panama City, and that's we got funding uh, from LSC to, to do uh, literacy. And so what libraries have been doing is filling 
jobs. Generally, what they do is they go ahead and do a plan, a strategic plan, and take a look at what's out there. If there already is a literacy program out there, then often they'll partner with that literacy program, uh, certainly provide space for the literacy program. But then there are a good number of counties that do not have much as far as literacy and as far as volunteer tutors. And this is why we're targeting some uh, a good number of the rural counties in Florida do not have um, volunteer literacy programs, especially for adults. And then there's this whole world, multi-literacy, our libraries and y'all out there have been doing this, have been doing a lot of computer literacy. And in doing that, I'm sure you're running into folks that actually cannot read very well. And certainly you've got the challenge of um, English language learners uh, coming in. So now the new label that I'm starting to run into is this whole multi-literacy that's not just one dimensional. In Florida, I think as far as actually running a literacy program, the library directly running it, uh, I know that Broward was one of the early ones um, to be doing that. Jacksonville too got a uh, CA grant as did Leon County here in Tallahassee. Uh, I mentioned Bay County, Panama City. So that's what's been overall happening as far as the growth. Now one of the changes and we'll be talking about applying for um, a federal library grant through us. March 16th the deadline for that. So if y'all happen to want to apply it's now LSTA. Um, Library Services and Technology Act, and there's not a set aside category like there was with LSCA. So that has to some degree impacted what libraries have been doing, especially at a, a national level. So that gives you sort of a, a picture of that. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, we have now a library literacy Planning Committee that was appointed by the state librarian and they came up with some recommendations of need and one of them was the need to get more programs out there. The particular value of the um, of what lib libraries are doing versus adult ed is the fact that reaching out and serving those lower level students because uh, uh, adult ed has a lot higher uh, requirements and Greg will know more basically about that. But this planning committee, one of the recommendations was to start really helping y'all um, grow your programs, y'all uh, create new programs if they're, if they're basically needed. Um, we're going to be put together some, a curriculum for new library literacy coordinators. We've seen a lot of turnover and staff with that. Uh, we'll be doing some how to use technology. Some of you have been out there doing that, but I don't know that it's been folded into volunteer training volunteers and students in uh, technology use with literacy. Uh, we know that Gainesville's got a work certificate program for lower level students who probably never, uh, learners who would never meet the criteria to be able to go into a technical you know, community college or you know, get a higher degree, so they've been working on that. And uh, certainly intergenerational literacy, family literacy are, are some of the areas that this planning committee has actually selected. Okay. So I've been talking some about the traditional basic model of library adult literacy. We talked about serving low level, literacy levels. Uh, some libraries do a lot more pre-GED, math, citizenship, financial. You know, they've, they've really been proactive, which is really cool. And things can be done, I'll tell you, on a minimum library staff and minimum budget. A lot of it's passion. A lot of it is, is overall support. Uh, when I was starting the program in Panama City, we kept our program relatively small. We were using our current staff, and so we kept it at that time, you know, 10 students getting solid, good um, training from a volunteer was good, and that's okay. Um, and staff can serve a lot of different uh, different roles, and but it's also good to have outside trainers too. Um, so you need to have trained volunteer tutors and instructors. That's a big, big part of 
is, is to have trained folks and then folks meet one-on-one -on -one with the tutor and usually you ask for one to two times a, a week, uh, an hour, hour and a half a time and ideally you ask for a year's, year's commitment. Um, there's basically sort of three models out there in the context of um, volunteer literacy. There is one, like you'll be hearing from from Susan, that as far as management, it's a There's another model out there that's here in Tallahassee, Leon County, and that's where they have the library, uh, has library staff, and then they also have a nonprofit. And the nonprofits can go after some funding, like United Way funding, that uh, may not be awarded to a government agency but it would they would uh, award to uh, to a nonprofit and then there are some libraries out there that have a pretty strong literacy program in the county so they they partner they provide meeting space um, they often have a staff person on their nonprofit board uh, certainly collections are part of the things they do so that gives you sort of a feel about the traditional basic model of library adult literacy okay so here's some Katrina you want to say a few words on sure hi I'm Katrina Evans and I'm the library director at Columbia County Public Library in Lake City and one um, recent but very important part of our literacy program has been the Career Online High School program, which was funded. Um, we started the program in 2015. It was funded for two years through the state legislature, and then there was a year of funding. And we had a, a year of funding again, and now we're currently in a year of no funding again. But through those three years of state funding, um, we've been able to provide the opportunity for local students to earn a fully accredited online um, high school diploma through the Career Online High School Program. And it also, in addition to just the high school diploma, provides a career cert certificate in one of several different career focuses. So, we we knew that there was a need certainly in our community for this sort of thing but we really had no idea how much of a need until we got started so in those three years of funding we've had um, 70 graduates from our program and the picture that you see here is the nine graduates um, at our most recent graduation ceremony which was in april of last year we're planning um, another graduation ceremony coming up in the next few months. We haven't picked a date yet, but we're, we're on track to do that um, because we have another group of graduates to celebrate. And through my 20 plus years in the library world, working in public libraries, this has really been one of the most rewarding programs that I've ever participated in, certainly. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Susan Mutchler from the Citrus County Library System. And our literacy program is going on 12 years old. And um, I was really fortunate that I was able to be a uh, part of the startup process of the adult literacy program. So um, I tend to have a little extra knowledge on how to start up. So feel free to ask me any questions even afterwards. Um, I chose this picture because I think it gives a really good example of how libraries can partner with other community organizations. So in this particular photo, we have the Daughters of the American Revolution who are setting up citizenship corners in our libraries. Um, and these are just really simple areas. They don't have to be necessarily a corner, but just an area in your library where you can put various materials, forms, official citizenship booklets, um, and you can download and print these for free pretty much from the USCIS.gov website. Um, but the Daughters of the American Revolution love to come to our citizenship classes and hand uh, constitution booklets. 
when we celebrate learners who have become new citizens, they love to be involved in that. Um, you know, they they pro provide materials. They it's just amazing. It's a great opportunity to partner uh, with the Daughters of the American Revolution. But I will add to Katrina's uh, information about the Career Online High School and the GED. It is just so meaningful. We do the same thing uh, like Katrina was talking about. We have the graduation, and it is just so meaningful. Um, I'm very fortunate to have an amazing colleague, April Frazier, and she's our literacy services librarian, and she just did a great job in uh, the last graduation that we had. It was very meaningful. So I, I mentioned that we started up our program 12 years ago, um, and literacy and libraries just go together. I mean, libraries are all about educating the masses, um, you know, changing lives. So it just made sense for us at the time to get involved in providing adult literacy services. But it was even scary once we learned that one out of every four people in Citrus County is functionally illiterate. And that is the term, functionally illiterate. That means that the person may not be able to read a street sign or read a food package label or even read a newspaper headline. So over the years, we've collected some of the different goals that people want to be able to do um, as adult learners in our literacy program. And those are typical things. I want to be able to read a newspaper headline like everyone else. Or, uh, you know, I'm a waitress and I cannot actually write down the food orders at my job. So I just want to be able to function better in society. That's all what literacy really is. It's about helping people to function better in society. The thing is, nearly 21,000 people in Citrus County do not have the high school diploma. So, um, you know, we were working together with other community organizations, getting referrals. We were getting requests from learners to help. And, you know, we decided to jump into this endeavor because we want to build a stronger community, a stronger Citrus County together. And that's what libraries do. We we educate, we advance education in the community, and um, you know, we really try to build a stronger community together. So Sandy mentioned a little bit before that there are different models how libraries get involved. Um, Citrus County is a good example of a library uh, run model. Um, at the time, it started out with just me and a reference librarian uh, 12 years ago. And then probably after about five years, uh, our library director saw the need. We would just keep, keep growing and growing and growing. And so we repurposed and changed one of the instruction and research or reference librarians to be a literacy services librarian. And I'm going to say that was the smartest move that was ever made. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there are different ways that libraries can support literacy. Um, Sandy mentioned before collections. Uh, we actually created a, a, a lit area in each of our branches. What's really cool about the, the literacy area is that even your homeschoolers and your educators will use it too. So it's not just for the adult literacy program that you're thinking of starting up or that you are starting up. You can really brand yourself, your library, as an educational leader in the community by having a literacy uh, collection. So digital literacy, you know, traditionally libraries have been teaching the computer classes and the computer skills and digital, digital literacy. So just want you to consider maybe adding to your, um, your class or your coursework. So IPAC for Citizenship is a new one that we're currently working on because we just found out uh, recently that the U.S. Citizen Immigration Services is now requiring all people applying for the naturalization exam when they come in to take the actual test, the exam, it's all done on iPad. So it doesn't make sense if we're preparing people with materials in our libraries and we're having uh, courses on how to pass the uh, naturalization exam, but we're not teaching the people the tech skills to go along with that. So 
iPad for citizenship is something that we're currently uh, looking into expanding. And then another thing was we found out that a lot of our adult learners were going to take the GED or the TABE, the Test of Adult Basic Education, or one of the other um, required exams, and they were not knowing how to maneuver the mouse or how to open up different windows or minimize windows or maximize windows. They didn't know how to access the calculator or the formulas. So we thought, wow, we, we need to teach our adult learners or have a class just based on that. You know, can your mouse pass the online exam? And to teach the adult learners how to access these tools quickly, easily, and skillfully. So if, if you are a library and you are not providing uh, direct literacy services, be providing uh, referrals. You can actually tell people, hey, this uh, adult literacy ex program exists, exists in our community, and you can be partnering with some of the other uh, agencies. Um, I know they changed their name, but we have the, work, we have the workforce bus that actually comes to our libraries and sets up in the parking lot. And so we refer people out there to even apply for jobs, and we partner with them. Um, just an example of how you can provide mutual referrals back and forth. You can be providing meeting space, whether it's in your community or if you have small, quiet study rooms, uh, letting, reaching out to those literacy organizations and telling them, hey, we would love to open up our library to have have some of those English language classes or to have some uh, different courses we would love to, we'd love to partner with you training work so I really feel strongly about this one that library staff can be viewed as training leaders even in the community um, what we did is like I said where our program is in existence 12 years we really learned everything that we can about adult literacy, and we continue to learn. Um, you can't be involved in adult literacy if you're not willing to learn yourself. So what I, why I'm saying the be the go-to is that our library director will often get a call or an email, and we'll ask, gee, we, have a, we know somebody who's struggling with uh, learning challenges or learning difficulties. Do you have any methods or strategies? And yes, our literacy librarian, April, or myself, will often uh, answer or get involved. And um, we do have strategies, which I probably won't go into today. But if anybody wants to know more, feel free to contact me. Um, but just being the go-to, being the educational leader in your community. Adult literacy really can help libraries be that go-to. The other thing is we're, we're training our volunteers. And by the way, Pro Literacy recommends a 12-hour new tutor training for volunteers. That's their recommendation. So we're doing that. Um, but we also have a lot of educators that will come to us. And we have helped uh, the United, United Way with their Reading Buddies program in the past as well. Correction staff actually will attend some of our tutor trainings um, from the either Coleman uh, which is not too far away from us, but we will actually get asked if correction staff can attend our trainings. So libraries also provide instruction with, with the trained volunteers. So Sandy had mentioned before in our model, the Citrus County Library System model, um, the Literacy Services Librarian and myself, we provide the instruction to the volunteers who turn around and provide the direct um, courses or one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions to the adult learners. I, I wanted to add one more thing. I think libraries should just know that you don't have to do all of these things at once. You can start out small. When we first started, our goal was to have 10 learners. That was our initial goal. Hi, this is Katrina Evans at Columbia County Public Library again. And I would just um, reemphasize what Susan just said in that 
you know, it might not be realistic and it's probably daunting to try to think if you're starting a program from scratch of, of how to do all of these things at one time. But um, you can start small and work on some individual pieces that you have the most need for and the time and staff to commit to. And then you can add on and build over time as you have more staff, more funding. And um, in that way, really, over time, build a literacy program that's uniquely suited to your library and your situation and the needs that you have there in your community. And one other thing I would add about that is that one of the most important things that you can do for your program, I think, is to find somebody who has a real heart for literacy to run your program, because that is something that really can't be purchased anywhere. You just, you know, you have to find that person who has that heart for literacy. And that um, that's something that we've been really fortunate to have here with our current literacy coordinator, Frank Lewis, and our previous literacy coordinator, Glennis Pound. Both of those people um, have really had a strong heart for literacy and for the students. And that makes a huge difference in a program, I think. So I was asked um, to give you a, a library director's perspective on the benefits of a library literacy program. And so just to give you a little bit of history about our literacy program, um, it's very similar to the traditional basic model that Sandy discussed earlier. Um, but we started out as um, a non-library program. We had um, a local literacy council that formed in 1986 um, and with donations from the local Altrusa chapter, um, a local church and a local business, they started the community's first literacy program. Now, several years later, um, the Literacy Council formed an agreement with the library to provide office space and tutorial room and a paid literacy coordinator. And um, so, at that point in time, the, the program was partially funded with county funding through the library and partially funded through the Literacy Council with um, funding from the local United Way. Eventually, the Literacy Council was dissolved and for more than a decade, the library has run the literacy program independently as one of our programs and services that we provide. So starting off, I would say that the major benefit, of course, is that a literacy program meets some of the vital needs in our community. Um, the obvious needs for things like basic literacy, ESOL classes, citizenship help, GED help, job skills, and other things like that. Um, one key is that these services are free and students can sometimes get help in other places but often those other places might charge a fee. And even a nominal fee is a barrier for many students. So this need for um, these services and, and free services specifically is one that the program meets. And it also meets the need for other things, sort of less tangible maybe, like um, support for students and learners, um, empowering students and um, building a community among students and tutors that, that benefits everyone in ways that we don't even know. In short, the program provides tangible benefits to the local community with a relatively small price tag. And what's good for the community is good for the library, and what's good for the library is good for the community. So it's a, it's a circle. Um, Second, I would say that the literacy program really helps to raise the public profile of the library and the community. It gives credibility and visibility to the library and it helps other people in the community and other organizations to think of the library as an important partner, especially an educational partner, and also as a safe place for people to come and um, get services that they need. It also opens the doors to a world of partnership opportunities. Our literacy program partners with organizations like um, Partnership for Strong Families, the local health department, 
Head Start, Senior Services, Local Services, um, Adult Ed, United Way, Florida Crown Schools. Just, I could go on and on. The Homeless Commission, um, Coalition, the Friends of the Library, so many more. But these partnerships then are often expanded to other areas of the library. So they're not just, you know, literacy partnerships anymore, but they are expanded and are used to assist not only the library students, but all of the library's users. So we have a part-time 30 hour per week paid literacy coordinator. Um, and that position also serves as the library's volunteer coordinator. So the position was developed in a way in that way, because many of the volunteers of the library were literacy volunteers, volunteer tutors. Um, but we've seen a benefit overall of promoting volunteerism. So we see that um, uh, through the volunteer literacy, the volunteer and literacy coordinator, our volunteer program strengthened overall. Um, Currently, Frank has worked to implement a successful volunteer program for high school students who need to earn their volunteer hours. And that's also allowed us to engage with these young adults in ways that we didn't before. So just different, um, you know, different volunteer opportunities that are strengthened through this position of a, a literacy and a volunteer coordinator. And finally, I would say that the literacy program creates new library users, advocates, and ambassadors in the community. So students now have the skills and exposure to use the library in ways that they might not have been able to, to use it before or even been aware of before. Our, ESO, um, our ESOL program helps to bring the diversity that's in our community into the library. And our tutors and volunteers become more involved and more knowledgeable about the programs and services that the library offers. So partnerships that are initiated with literacy also expand. Um, they expand the library's reach and they bring in new library users and advocates. So much happens through word of mouth and the literacy program is, in, is an incredible source of word of mouth promotion of the library. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about funding. Um, and so I, yeah, I'm sorry. go ahead. No, go ahead. Good, yeah, the good news is that, um, as Sandy referenced earlier, this doesn't have to be a big ticket item, uh, especially as you're starting out. Um, the use of volunteers is almost all these programs have is sort of the uh, a commonality in terms of having tutors and teachers who are trained. Um, really does help to make these programs um, um, very economical. Um, and so across the state, we'll find that some programs may have, you know, just a few thousand dollars in addition to a little bit of staff time invested in, in doing this versus you know, right up to some programs that have budgets of several hundred thousand dollars. So I want to talk with you a little bit about some of the opportunities here. I'm going to turn over to Sandy on the first one with regard to um, funds available through the Library Services and Technology Act. So, Sandy? Uh, Greg, uh, so the big thing coming up is March 16th is the deadline for writing an LSTA grant this year. The date is usually around March each year. Uh, as I did mention, we don't have a set-aside category for adult literacy. A lot of it is building the case um, for your community and the need uh, for your um, residents of your community. Something uh, that we do here with the Bureau of Library Development, we actually read drafts. And, and what I would be glad to do is, I'm pretty good at the front end, sort of the idea, you know, various directions that you could go and sort of point you into, well, you need to do some more investigation on this. So I'd be glad to talk with any of you about putting together an LSTA uh, uh, grant. And then once you get a grant draft written, we will read them and 
feedback. And what we have found, no matter what the category is, the time and I know you have busy lives I understand that but those of you that take the time to um, get a draft into us what I do is look sort of at the literacy side of it and the big picture side then we have folks who will read a draft um, and really take the look of it technically and take a look at it in the sense of they don't know that much about literacy oh you got some holes here I don't understand what this means uh, so that just gives you a little bit of background on LSTA. Okay, very good. So um, I know LSTA has been a great source for quite a few libraries over the years funding literacy efforts. So uh, certainly encourage you to take a close look at that. In addition to that, um, Dollar General. Now Dollar General uh, is the largest corporate literacy funder uh, or funder of adult literacy in the in the country um, every who's within 10 miles of a dollar general which I think is everybody in Florida actually uh, is, is eligible all those programs or libraries would be eligible to apply there's actually two streams of funding one of them uh, that's actually available right now uh, is their their adult literacy grants and those grants are going to be due actually pretty soon on um, uh, the 20th of February. So um, may, this might be a little harder if you haven't started a program, but if those of you who have existing programs, they do fund um, a range of community-based and uh, library-based programs. Uh, the grants are up to $10,000. There's also a special uh, initiative funded through Dollar General in partnership with the American Library Association called the American Dreams Grant. And uh, this is something that they make available nationally. Um, and it's traditionally the RFP comes out in the fall around October with grants due in December. And these likewise are grants of up to uh, $10,000. And I believe, uh, Susan, you got one of these at one point. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, yes. We did get the American Dreams grant. Um, we got it for $5,000. Uh, we got it for English language learners and for new citizens. And one of the things that we did with the money was to make collections in, in all of our branches of something called adult new readers, which are adult content uh, books, but written on a lower level. And so the adults are not embarrassed to be seen holding an adult new reader. And we focused on the classics and in the fact that we were going to hold little book clubs based on these adult new readers with the English language learners. So the other thing I just want to point out here is, is if you are a public library and you have to go through a lot of red tape that you have to get your grants approved months in advance, I'm just going to speak that a lot of times I'll work with my friends groups and work on the grant with them and they will actually submit it. So the American Dreams grant was submitted by one of our friends groups, and they are they are the nonprofit as well. So, so they could in that grant they wrote that that we are applying on behalf of the Citrus County Library System, and if the funds are awarded, we will turn around and give the entire uh, funds to the Citrus County Library System. So I just want to point that out that um, the American Dreams grant we did do that through the friends. The Pro Literacy National Book Fund, again, I had the friends apply for that with me working with the presidents and writing what we wanted to get in that. Um, because we do, we tend to have to submit grant things months in advance. So sometimes that can be a little bit of a red tape issue. So it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's easier to work with the friends. Okay, very good. Thank you, Susan. Um, so, um, Another point on the National Book Fund, and this is basically uh, an opportunity to apply for resources, materials, um, primarily through New Readers Press, but New Readers Press is, is one of the largest and most um, well-regarded publishers in adult literacy. Uh, they um, have this fund where you can, programs can apply and receive um, instructional materials, other content. Um, through their publisher 
uh, New Reader's Press, and uh, they they just got a real shot in the arm because they won uh, the X Prize. There was an X Prize Communities Competition, uh, and uh, they were one of the winners of that. And the full amount of the the monies, I think it was a hundred thousand dollars, was awarded is going into the um, National Book Fund to bolster that. So um, this it's best best time ever, I think, to apply for. Um, uh, for that uh, grant, and that's open right now, and it's actually continues to be open for several months. Uh, the Florida Literacy Coalition, we have a few grants that we manage here. Um, one is uh, supported through uh, Florida Blue, uh, that's our Blue Cross and Blue Shield company here in Florida, and um, they've been a long standing supporter of a health literacy initiative that we have. Um, and this is a special focus on integrating health education into literacy and English language curriculum uh, and instruction. So uh, these grants are up to are up to five thousand uh, dollars. Again, sort of a contextualized approach to instruction, helping students to understand um, how to um, you know what to expect when they go to a doctor, how to read prescription medicine labels. Uh, good healthy lifestyle choices and how that ties to um, you know chronic diseases and things of that nature. Um, some of it's very mental stuff, but a lot of people, especially people who are and not native to this country, um, find our healthcare system to be pretty confusing. I guess you don't necessarily have to be <laughs> from another country to have that experience, but especially if they have something in their countries systems are run quite differently understanding a little bit about health insurance and how they might be able to access um, um, supplemental insurance or, or um, you know through the um, Affordable Care Act and so forth so um, so that's a grant uh, and we we, pro we manage that and also provide professional development in support of that that grant actually just wrapped up uh, our open application to that just wrapped up but we're expecting to offer that again next year so just want to kind of put that on your radar we also have a grant that's supported through Wells Fargo a similar approach uh, but with a focus on financial education and financial literacy again integrating that into adult education and literacy ESL instruction um, and uh, and those grants usually have same amount five thousand uh, dollars those grants usually come available in the summer in July so be on the lookout for that um, we also have some training material grants that we uh, make available through uh, one of our largest supporters the Florida Department of Education to provide training materials for if you're doing a training workshop uh, for the tutors um, and to be able to help supplement that um, also do trainings for tutors on, on occasion too we can't kind of go in and be your full-time training team but um, we we can uh, fulfill requests to do trainings there we do a lot of trainings um, uh, throughout the state uh, the Florida Humanities Council has a program called um, uh, the prime time family reading time uh, some of you may be familiar with this um, I mentioned it here, but with the understanding, I went to their website. It looks like they do not have an open application for this year. They were only funding previously um, funded programs, but um, that may be that may change in the future. And there's a number there on their website to call if you're interested. Uh, Susan mentioned the Friends of the Library. They're traditionally a very strong supporter. Um, you know, this is kind of changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but the, the point that they can not only provide funding and support, but sometimes be a conduit for applying to other grants. So, um, so those are some of the, the potential funding resources out there um, to support um, literacy programming efforts. Um, go to the next slide. Turn it back over to you, Susan. Yeah, okay. Um, so community partnerships, uh, support and funding. Katrina did an excellent job before explaining how, you know, libraries tend to partner already with these different partnerships, these community organizations, but adult literacy even that relationship further. Um, one of the things that I've found is that local giving is in. Um, when we go out and we talk to groups and we and they hear all the magnificent things 
that our public library system is doing to advance education and to improve the community, people want to be a part of it. They really do. Um, we, we did get our very first initial startup 12 years ago um, from a foundation. Um, I had the courage and I went in and I did a little presentation. Uh, they did want to see a complete business plan, believe it or not. Um, and I got half the money that I asked for, but it was still pretty substantial. And that's what was able to get us our literacy program started 12 years ago. But since then, um, we have uh, at least two other private foundations that give to us annually specifically for the adult literacy. Um, and it's funny because um, our literacy librarian, April, and myself, when we sent out invitations to these community partnerships to invite them to our graduation celebration, even those that responded that they couldn't make it, uh, immediately after we were receiving checks in the mail from, from these community partnerships saying that, you know, they couldn't make the graduation, but um, they wanted to make this donation. So it's just amazing how they see that we're making a difference and they want to be a part of it. So your women's clubs tend to be uh, great supporters of adult literacy. Not only will they want to be your tutors or instructors, but they usually want to be your funders. Um, we have one women's club here from the GFWC. You know what they do that's pretty cool? They buy us these little pins that we give to our adult learners. So little gold basic books for those who improve their reading level, just the adult basic education learners. Then we have some that are flags that if they become a citizen, they get one of those. Um, and we also have little diplomas. So anybody who gets their GED or their career online high school through the library system gets these little pins because the women's club like to sponsor that for us every year. Um, Altrusa is the, another one that has literacy in their, uh, in their um, I don't know, bylaws or in their, in their uh, formal, um, um, I can't think of the word, I guess bylaws. So some of these groups like Daughters of the American Revolution, I know literacy is definitely a component um, that's wrapped up into their belief system. Um, like I said, they, they can be tutors, they can come and help you celebrate uh, learners, they can fund little citizenship corners in your libraries, uh, help you buy some new citizenship materials for your libraries, they can physically come in and set up the area. Uh, fast food chains, Pizza Hut and Subway, they do a lot with us with the early literacy. Um, they will give us like reading coupons or you know reading celebration type of things for the family literacy or the early literacy. Uh, the big chain stores, uh, Walmart is amazing to us and awards us five bikes every year for our summer reading program. Uh, Target will give us um, here and there for prizes or for reading chests prizes or that type of thing. Uh, uh, now with the Target, I have the friends, I work with the friends groups and they actually write the letter. Um, and that's how I do that with, with, with Target. Your civic associations and your rotary clubs, um, often these people will look for speakers uh, and that's how we tend to get our word out. We'll say, we would love to tell you about the adult literacy, um, you know, Pro, you know, we tell, talk about our adult literacy program, but when we go out, we share statistics, kind of like Greg did earlier. We give some worldwide statistics, we give some state statistics, and then we talk about the real problem right here in Citrus County and what the library is doing to hopefully overcome that literacy problem. So uh, these groups love to have speakers come out, um, and so that's what we do. Banks and credit unions, uh, like the Suncoast Credit Union, Wells Fargo, uh, Capital City, these are ones that have supported our adult literacy in the past or financial literacy. They will come in and teach financial literacy, not only to your adult learners, but also to your tutors. We've had some joint ses sessions, learning sessions with the um, volunteer tutors and the adult learners. And then a Val a Volunteer Adult Literacy in Florida, uh, Sandy has always been involved in that, um, and they have provided uh, mini grants uh, to literacy programs too. After 
filling out their application. So local giving is definitely in. Um, there's these opportunities for these community partnerships. It's just a, it's just a great thing. Maybe I should add that one of the one of the documents that um, I shared with uh, all of you today that Nicole put up there is uh, a sample funding request. This is actually an example of I actually have had all these funded. So if you download it and you can take a look, these are the way that I go about asking uh, people locally for monies. I'll write up a little uh, catchy phrase. So take a look at that. Um, and hopefully it'll help you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I just want to share a little bit about some of the resources that um, FLC has available. We're here to support your efforts, um, and uh, we won't be able to get into too much detail, but we offer a variety of different kinds of things. We have a statewide hotline. We share a lot of resources, free and low-cost instructional resources. Uh, we provide technical assistance. Um, uh, we would love to have you uh, join our email list uh, so that we can send you information on what we have coming up. We do quite a few trainings, in-person webinars. We have great opportunities that I mentioned earlier. Uh, any other developments in the field? Um, we do a statewide essay book. Um, just a, a number of different things going on. Um, I'm going to touch on these quickly so in the interest of time, but uh, we have some stuff coming up with regard to uh, professional development opportunities, starting with our online tutor training course. This is something that we offer several times a year. And it's starting up actually here pretty soon. Although you can start, you can start the volunteers a little bit later than February the 12th. This is uh, has some flexibility here. It's a facilitated online course uh, to train new volunteer uh, tutors, um, and you have to kind of round that out with information specific to your program. We have our uh, annual Literacy Leadership Institute coming up um, March 9th and 10th, uh, and that um, is also a free event, as is the online tutor training. Um, so no, no cost involved with that. Most of the trainings that we do are free. We do have our annual conference. That's not free, but we, tr we definitely try to keep our costs, uh, our registration costs reasonable. Uh, that's going to be the 29th through a April 29th through May the 1st. We're going to be back in the Orlando area in Lake Mary. This year, it's a statewide conference, uh, and we offer um, usually about um, 60, 70 different sessions. Um, and there's more information on our, our website. Um, and we'd love to have you out to participate in that if you're interested. We also have, as part of that, uh, some awards that we offer annually, and we have our open call for nominations right now. So please check that out, individual and organizational business awards uh, recognizing excellence in literacy um, and then uh, as part of the conference the free conference day and then extends beyond that we're doing uh, a train the tutor trainer which is something that we offer every other year uh, it's pr fairly comprehensive training of volunteer tutor trainers so um, and Susan actually is our trainer for that so um, anything you'd like to add Susan on that uh just that we'll be going over the pro literacy, um, the six trainer concepts and competencies, right. and best practice. It's a great thing. Yeah, it is. It, can, it leads toward um, pro literacy, which our national organization pro literacy uh, trainer certification. So that's our website. You know, check us out. There's lots of resources, resources there, um, and we're we're here to we're here to help and to be of service. So um, next slide. Since we're getting a little short on time, um, take a look. Basically, you want to research what's going out there in your community already in regards to adult literacy. You want to look at your local statistics and literacy levels. And Greg mentioned that the new PIAC report is coming out in March. Um, know that you can start adult literacy with minimum staff and minimum budget. Know that you will get um, local support and local funding support probably from your community and other foundations. Um, don't forget to look at the Florida Literacy Coalition and Pro Literacy as, uh, for their free online literacy trainings, and they have curricula. They're just wonderful support. Our library uh, program would have never gotten started without the Flor 
Florida Literacy Coalition. We have everything to owe them to our program. And then Sandy has um, a State Library Literacy Networking Group that she sends out periodical um, information on. Next slide. Okay, well, I guess we're we're at the end of our session. We have about 10 minutes here. Uh, here's our contact information. Um, and um, so why don't we go ahead and uh, unmute the phones if we can, and then open it up for any uh, questions that folks might have. Somebody had a question mark Robert did next to his name. Is there a question typed in somewhere? Um, uh, Robert was answering the first question in the... Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. You, can, you can either type your question into that chat box or, um, you know, just ask it, you know, if uh, unmute, unmute yourself. How do you go ahead and unmute yourself again? Can you remind folks of how to do that? So if you'd Nicole? like to... So if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and go to your audio section and click on, you'll either have a microphone icon or a, a telephone icon. Um, and if you have that, go ahead and, and click that if you'd like to um, ask a question to any of our panelists. Or you can type a question into the questions box and I can read it out loud for you. Okay, very good. Uh, we do have one question here. Um, and I'll ask I'll, um, I'll ask Greg um, specifically. Is there a specific training for health literacy? Oh, health literacy. Yes. Um, so we do uh, a number of trainings throughout the year on health literacy. We'll have a pre-conference session uh, that's like a half day, or actually I think about three-hour session that's on on health literacy in person. We also developed um, recently an online health literacy uh, training course. It's tied in part to some curriculum material that I didn't mention, but we have a curriculum called uh, Staying Healthy, uh, which is it was developed specifically for um, uh, teaching uh, English language and literacy learners uh, health concepts that's freely available uh, to download. And for uh, Florida programs, we do have um, some uh, hard copy materials we can provide too, not not in unlimited numbers, but we can give you a classroom set of hard, hard copy materials. So you can go online and, and find out or check that out and see if that might be good for you. But yeah, we, we offer health literacy related training um, uh, throughout the year. The next one will be at our at our conference and as well as we'll have a health literacy track at the conference too with several sessions. In the, in the online course, I just want to mention is a self-paced course. So that's not a facilitated course. You can take that anytime. Other questions or comments? We have a comment here. Um, thank you for all these wonderful webinars and for all the help and guidance you've given us as we are getting our program started. We're excited to be recruiting tutors and learners. First in-person tutor training workshops are coming up soon. Oh, well, great. Glad to hear that's working out. Thank you. And that's all we have in terms Any of other questions? questions. Okay. Well, uh, what we'd like to do is to um, continue this conversation if folks are interested or provide an opportunity to do that. Maybe get into a little bit more details in terms of what, what's involved with um, running or starting uh, a library-based literacy program. And so um, we'd, we'd be interested in having another conference call, but wanted to get a sense as to how many people might be interested in that. Um, and it would be sort of a, not, not as much of a presentation, but more of a, a conversation. And, and you can certainly reach out to any one of us. Uh, we've provided our emails here too to provide some, um, you know, to chat with or provide additional support. But um, uh, can we um, ask folks, we just wanted to kind of get a sense as to how many people might be interested in participating in a conference call like that. 
um, and ask people to maybe raise their hand. Nicole, can you remind us how you raised your hand? Yeah, you should have a little hand icon uh, on the left side of your panel. Um, it's it's kind of under that that uh, red arrow. Um, so that's how you can uh, press that. So just uh, we'd like to just see a show of hands. So if you could press that uh, that hand icon if you're interested. Show of hands on that. Okay, very good. Okay, okay. I see a number of you have raised your hand. Brooke, Kathy, Dawn, so forth. Okay, very good. So that gives us an idea. Um, and we'll we'll be in contact uh, so we can get a date set that's mutually convenient for everyone. Um, any other comments from uh, the panelists as, as we begin to close this out, given that we don't have any additional questions just want to give everybody for coming and certainly please touch base with me um, at any point with any questions or if you just want to chat and you're trying to figure things out be glad to if you're looking at the applying for the grant of course you heard what I said earlier is the um, be glad to talk with you about potential ideas what might be right for your community but also we'll be able to read drafts if you can manage to get it uh, to us with okay. enough time to read the drafts. Yeah, that's a, a great opportunity in the corner. Okay, well, we are going to be sending you all uh, an evaluation tomorrow. We appreciate it if you could take a few minutes and fill that out and provide us with some feedback on your experience for this um, this webinar. Um, I want to thank our panelists, all did a job sharing um, their insights and, and experience. Um, I think um, there's a, a potential uh, for literacy programs to, I mean, for libraries to do even more work in expanding on some of the fantastic work that's already been done in, in literacy. Uh, uh, we're certainly happy to partner in that effort and, um, and do hope that you all will consider, if you don't have a, a literacy program, consider um, maybe starting one, supporting what's happening locally. So. Um, We'll be in contact for those of you who are interested in continuing the conversation. And uh, with that, I uh, wish you all a good afternoon. Take care. And thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.